today. As North Korea launches more tests, where are its nukes headed next? And what's Kim Jong-un's in game? Our experts weigh in. And then, start the school year right with Dr. Kevin Lehman. Learn how to prep your kids for the classroom and beyond on today's 700 Club. Hey, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Well, that bunch of crazies in the North Korea have done it again. They made its latest and most powerful threat yet coming in the form of a hydrogen bomb, underground test, big explosion, maybe 60 or 70 times more powerful than the one we dropped in Hiroshima in Japan. Well, now the question is, how will the United States and the world respond to this provocation? Well, while North Korea is moving ahead with its nuclear weapons program, it's also working on the missiles to deliver them to other countries, including the United States. Dale Hurd has the story. As tense as the situation with North Korea has already become, it could get worse. South Korea believes the North is planning another missile launch within a few days. The test launch of what some suspect will be an intercontinental ballistic missile capable of hitting the United States could come this Saturday. That's the anniversary of North Korea's founding, and leader Kim Jong-un may want to show off his ability to target the U.S. with nuclear weapons. The stakes could not be higher. The urgency is now. And at a special meeting of the U.N. Security Council Monday, the U.S. repeated its warning to North Korea. Nuclear powers understand their responsibilities. Kim Jong-un shows no such understanding. His abusive use of missiles and his nuclear threats show that he is begging for war. Japan, which had a North Korean missile fly through its airspace, told the Security Council something must be done. The Security Council must act to stop North Korea from continuing down this road. South Korean warships conducted live fire exercises at sea today in a show of strength after the North conducted its biggest nuclear test ever of a hydrogen bomb. On Monday, Seoul used F-15 fighter jets and land-based ballistic missiles to simulate an attack on North Korea's nuclear test site to strongly warn the North over the recent detonation. China has begun nuclear radiation emergency drills along its border with North Korea. President Trump asked in Washington if he would attack North Korea, said, we'll see. Russia, China and the European Union all claim there is no military solution to the crisis, but all have condemned North Korea. The path undertaken by North Korea is dangerous, irresponsible and illegal. No U.S. military action appears imminent, and U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley is calling for the strongest possible sanctions against North Korea at the U.N., while the Trump administration looks into penalties against nations that do business with the North. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, what do you do? How are you going to put a penalty on China that has trade with the United States of four to five hundred billion dollars a year? Some of the most important things that we receive, we get from China, and what we sell, we sell to China. Sanctions seem to be the main weapon against North Korea. And for more on that, we're joined by uh, Anthony Ruggiero. Anthony is a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. He worked in the U.S. government for 17 years. He was a U.S. advisor to the talks in North Korea in 2000, and, uh, let's see, five. And he, we so pleasure to welcome him to the 700 Club. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, it looks like they say uh, the people in, in Seoul, we've got about a million people at risk under the uh, guns of North Korea. Uh, what can we do to stop this provocation? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I think you said it right, that uh, sanctions are the best and, and peaceful means to uh, limit North Korea's programs and, and to try and attempt to roll them back. Uh, sanctions right now on North Korea are nowhere near what we had on against Iran, uh, you know, starting about seven years ago. So we really need to ramp up sanctions that, unfortunately, we know what the problem is, but we haven't really been able to tackle it, which is China and Russia. They're, they're the problems. They're the ones whose firms and individuals, and in the case of China, Chinese banks, 
that are facilitating North Korea's sanctions evasion. Well, our trade with China is enormous. We're dependent on China for so many of the goods we use here in this country. Uh, and the trade that we sell, uh, our airplanes and things like that, how, how do we put biting sanctions on the Chinese if they deal with the North Koreans? Sure. Uh, you know, that's always a, 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 con a concern. And, and what we have to do is make sure that the sanctions are, are targeted. Uh, first, first off, we have to remember that these uh, firms and individuals and banks are breaking U.S. law. Uh, so the option of not doing something uh, is not really an option because we need to protect the U.S. financial system and enforce U.S. law. But what, is it, what that doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean that we have to go to the extreme level of prohibiting these banks uh, from the U.S. financial system. It doesn't mean that we have to start some kind of trade war. There are ways to do this. I believe that the Trump administration is doing this. Uh, they, they're starting, you know, what I like to call it is an escalation ladder. Uh, and they're right now sort of at the end of the bottom of that ladder. They're moving up that ladder slowly. They've gone after one Chinese bank. They've gone after a bunch of Chinese companies and individuals. Uh, I think the next level will be going after another Chinese bank or banks. Uh, but there are ways to do this before we get to sort of the end of that escalation, which would be uh, more extreme and, and harm the U.S.-China relationship. You know, Anthony, we have at the NSA the most sophisticated cyber uh, warfare capability in the world. Uh, could we use that against North Korea to really shut them down from a cyber attack? Well, there, you know, there have been some rumors that uh, the United States is using cyber offensive cyber activities against uh, North Korea's missile uh, systems. So, you know, that was one of the reasons given for some of the failures that we saw before, some of the missile failures we saw before. But now we've seen a, a string of successes. So maybe there's not a one for one match. Uh, certainly, that would be something that that, that should be looked at. Uh, I, I'm more focused, frankly, on defending ourselves against North Korea's cyber activities. You know, after North Korea really tried to devastate Sony Pictures after the, the movie, the interview in 2014, uh, and some of the things that North Korea has done against South Korea in the cyber realm, uh, and, you know, trying to steal a billion dollars from a Bangladesh bank uh, using the New York Federal Reserve, uh, you know, North Korea is very sophisticated on its cyber side, and I'm not sure that we're really ready for that. You know, the North Koreans have imposed tremendous pain on their own population, and the thought is that they can survive almost any sanctions that come against them. Uh, what, what can we do to stop this? Well, let me ask you about one other thing, too. You know, the idea of an EMP blast of a uh, nuclear missile in the atmosphere say 10, 15 miles in the air above Chicago, could literally fry all the electronics in America. Have, have, have you considered that? And uh, are people taking that seriously? And what could, can we do to defend, to defend against it? So on your first point on human rights, certainly North Korea, you know, uh, starves its own people. You know, they, there's, the numbers are uh, anywhere, you know, probably 100,000 of their own citizens in, uh, in essentially, you know, prison camps. Uh, you know, suffering uh, levels of torture that probably people cannot even imagine. Uh, and certainly uh, the, the regime uh, does not use its revenue for its people. Uh, in terms of, you know, how, how could we, you know, there's this sort of belt tightening, this, this uh, sort of slightly a myth uh, on belt tightening against sanctions. Uh, you know, North Korea uses their revenue for three purposes, for their weapons programs, for their military, and to buy luxury goods to keep the elites happy. Uh, if we start tightening the revenue, they're going to have to make a choice amongst those three. Uh, and all three are necessary for survival. So for them, they're going to have to make some uh, tough choices. On an EMP, I haven't, I haven't seen any evidence that that's their, their uh, goal or purpose. Uh, I, you know, I think it's more likely if they were going to you know, uh, send a, a missile toward the United States that it would have a uh, you know, a nuclear weapon that they would be intending to use against the United States versus uh, an EMP, which we, we, we haven't seen really any evidence of them testing. But I, I'll also say that, you know, I'm, I'm always in the business of not underestimating North Korea. 
Uh, I think there are too many people out there that uh, sort of rely on, well, we haven't seen that or, or looking for those type of clues. Uh, so North Korea could certainly be working on, you know, next level, uh, you know, EMP or something along those lines. One last question. Do you think they have been able to weaponize uh, a thermonuclear device to put it on the nose cone of a rocket and to hit the United States? Have they been able to do that, do you think, or not? Well, it looks like, you know, I think most of the intelligence assessments that have been unfortunately leaked uh, suggest the miniaturization part of that, you know, making it the right size to fit on the, the nose cone uh, has happened. Uh, you know, I think time will tell. We'll have to wait the next couple of days to see what type of device. The interesting part of this test is usually every nuclear test. I think most people think it's it was probably a multi-stage nuclear weapon. Uh, the interesting thing apart about this test is usually they uh, tunnel they tunnel into a mountain and it's and the blast is self-contained. But apparently there was a second uh, collapse. There was a collapse of, the, of their tunnel, perhaps, uh, which could indicate that there will be the release of some gases that could be analyzed and give us some clues about what the device was and what was tested. Well, Anthony, thank you very much. This is Anthony Ruggiero, our expert be many years about what's going on in North Korea. Well, in other news, the damages from Hurricane Harvey could cost up to 180 billion, that's 180 billion dollars. And the worst may not yet be over for many Texas, Texans in West Houston. The cleanup continues, more water will have to be released from dams in the area, and that will bring even more flooding to those poor people. Our reporter, Eric Rosales, shows us the new damage it will leave behind. We are in West Houston, just about a mile or so away from where the releases took place, and you can see the damage that was left behind. This is pretty much the only way that you can get around in the neighborhood in Houston. It's about five to six feet of water that is gradually going down, but the results inside many of these homes is catastrophic. It's completely wiped out. Everything's at least was in two feet of water at least up there, all furniture's gone, appliances, everything. Engineers tell CBN News the rush is on right now for hundreds of thousands to get as much as possible out of their water-soaked West Houston homes because over the next five days more water has to be released from two nearby reservoirs which were built in the 1940s. Emergency workers say the dams are showing their age and could give way if more water is not released to ease the pressure on them. Meanwhile, people have been going through their homes and taking stock of the damages. We lost a lot, we lost a lot, lot. Um, but it's just worldly possessions. They are just grateful to fellow Texans, strangers who have showed up at their home to help rip out the carpet and drywall. There's so much beauty that the Lord is bringing out of this. I just can't tell you. It, it's worth it all almost because it's really what it's all about. It's the bride of Christ being together in one. We're blessed. We're truly blessed to have some friends who had a, a house to allow us to move there and say, look, don't worry about it for now. Just get in, get your stuff in there. It's your home and uh, be blessed. The whole Church Unlimited Network. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. All right. That's all in Rockport, that's along the Texas coastline and nearly a dozen other cities throughout the state, Operation Blessing is providing people with important supplies they need, along with emotional support. I need y'all to fill this out front and back. There's four pages, lots of signatures. Working side by side with FEMA crews, Operation Blessing volunteers help clean up what Hurricane Harvey left behind. I feel real bad, and that's why I want to. I came out here to help out, and uh, you know, do my part, you know, into helping out. Something. You know, it's little, it's little something, but something. But through it all, Texans are strong, resilient, and know God will bring a brighter tomorrow. And y'all are out there helping more people. Operation Blessing, y'all are the only people that I've seen out here helping right now. But Operation Blessing, the word blessing is, is y'all are a blessing right now to, these, to us here in this community. This is one of the neighborhoods hard hit by uh, the floodwaters. You can see all of the worldly possessions of someone, and this is what's happening neighborhood after neighborhood. This uh, this actually was cleared out by members of Operation Blessing, volunteers from Operation Blessing, and you know you go through this, and this is uh, this is people's stuff. 
you know, they have furniture, they have clothes, they have toys. And that's the biggest thing is the parents are trying to get rid of these toys because it, what was in that flood water, everything from gasoline to oil to, to even raw sewage. Uh, we're joined with Jody Geddes from Operation Blessing. Thank you so much for joining us. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, we're here in the Port, uh, Port Arthur uh, Beaumont area, but this is just one of the areas where volunteers have helped out with Operation Blessing, correct? Yeah, absolutely, Eric. We are working all over the state of Texas. Uh, we've had over 2,300 volunteers working in Rockport, wow. which is one of the hardest areas where Hurricane Harvey made landfall. We're working here in um, Port Arthur as well as Beaumont. And then, of course, we're working in about eight cities total throughout Texas. And how can people help? How can they get involved? You you, you still need volunteers, correct? Absolutely. This There's a long road of recovery. And if there's anything we need is, of course, financial resources, but human resources. So if you'd like to volunteer, please go to operationblessing.org and click on volunteer we'd love to help have you come out and help us help the people of texas and you're also providing spiritual healing as well for them oh my goodness absolutely i mean the greatest calling we have is to resurrect hope in people i mean they're devastated this is ruth's home behind me elderly lady that has a disabled adult niece that lives behind her um, as well as you know elderly people all around they're in total state of shock lots of tears yesterday just here to love on them all right well thank you so much for for your hard work with Operation Blessing. Thank you so much, Jody. Well, again, uh, uh, folks out here, they lost everything. You know, I mean, anything that anybody can help, uh, just uh, go to operationblessing.org, and that's the way to do it. Pat. Sir, I want to say one word to Jody before she leaves. Uh, Jody, tell me about the faith level of these people. It's extraordinary. They have lost everything, devastation, and they, 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 they're just helpless. And you know, what is the spiritual level of these wonderful people? Well, Pat, they're trying to hold on to hope, of course, but um, as I walked the streets yest yesterday in this neighborhood, it was tough. Um, Ruth was very distraught. Sandra across the street, another elderly lady. They have, they can't help themselves, Pat. And so right now it's the reality of coming back to their homes and seeing everything that they've worked for, everything they've lived for completely in ruins in the pile behind me. There's pictures of their children, their grandchildren. I mean, the stuff that's on the side of the road, is stuff that money can't buy, but Operation Blessings here. And I feel like our greatest calling is to resurrect hope in the precious lives of these hearts that are here in Port Arthur and all throughout Texas. Amen. I heard, uh, I think Bill Horning was telling me about Beaumont, that the sewage system went out and the, the nothing but polluted water and, and they couldn't flush toilets. Could you go into that in some detail? Yeah, that is correct, Pat. Yes, sir. It was really hard here in Beaumont. Um, the water supply went out. So not only was it contaminated, like you turned the faucet on, it didn't come out. So obviously the people are the most important, Pat, but even us as relief workers in here, we were struggling just to flush the toilet. We were having to carry in huge tanks of water just to pour into the toilet to be able to go to the restroom. We could, no one could take showers. And think about it. I mean, of course, we have, we have great resources, RVs and stuff like that, but these people have lost everything they had. And being without water in America, we're not used to that at all. And so it's just a struggle to survive. The water's coming on and off at times, but it's still not at full capacity. So as well as in Port Arthur. So again, we just need prayers um, for these folks, not only for volunteer help, but just to kind of survive the circumstances. All right. Thank you, Eric. And thank you for Jody. God bless you. And Operation Blessing is there, folks. And you can help. Uh, th th they need help. They need finances. And uh, so it's an uh, easy number, 1-800-700-7000. Uh, um, and you can uh, log on to CBN.com. Uh, it's disaster relief. And we, we're there, Operation Blessing. And we're not going anywhere, I might add. We stay in these places until we get the job done. And so we are probably the largest uh, uh, mobilizer of volunteers. So if, if our people are out there, we, we have uh, you know, a, a thousand or so volunteers working and we all mobilize them into a distinct groups so they can go and help these people. The people, for example, if they don't bring that junk out to the edge of the, of the uh, property, FEMA won't pick it up. So if it's uh, 10 or 20 feet behind, they won't pick it up. So we've got to help them, the elderly people, for example, bring this stuff out so that the FEMA people will pick it up. Well, I also was thinking about Ruth and Sandy as she talked about them. Who cuts out the drywall? Who pulls yeah. out the wet, 
yeah. insulation. I mean, somebody has to go into those homes and do that before well, mildew and these, mold starts. These volunteers do it, and God bless every one of them. They're coming down to help. Well, anyhow, it's a tra tragedy of, uh, of, of, we use the term biblical proportion, but you just can't conceive of the horror. But we were here, and we were praying for people, and yesterday was our Labor Day prayer meeting, and Terry will tell us about that. Well, uh, here at CBN, Labor Day, that day is more than just a holiday. Back in 1961, before the first broadcast hit the airwaves, all of our employees gathered on Labor Day for a time of prayer, and we've made it a tradition ever since then. This year, we made sure that the staff of CBN, Regent University, and Operation Blessing lifted up in prayer all of those affected by Hurricane Harvey. Take a look. You can't conceive of the devastation. The people have lost everything, lost everything. All of their earthly possessions gone. Great swaths of the area are underwater. There are many that are fighting for their lives. I spent a lot of time down in Katrina during that awful storm that hit New Orleans, but it's nothing compared to what's happened with Harvey uh, in Texas. Pray for those brave people. Continue to uphold them. Continue to support them. Operation Blessing is working. CBN International is working. We're all working down there to help those people as much as we can, and we're praying. So. Let's not stop praying because the damage and the heartache will go on for years. It's not something that's short term. So thank you for your prayers. God bless you. Thank you. I want to just add that if you are someone who can volunteer, they're going to be looking for people to help for a long time. So again, the same information Pat gave, 1-800-700-7000 is the number to call, or you can log on to CBN.com. Well, still ahead, Pat goes on the hot seat for another round of Your Questions, Honest Answers. Lance says, my pastor recently told the congregation that married couples must have children. I thought this was a personal choice. Is this a mandate from God? Pat's going to weigh in on that and more when we come back. Well, a few days ago, we featured the story of a researcher who had cracked the code of Alzheimer's and his treatment of the disease is nothing short of revolutionary. Well, the response to that story has been overwhelming. So we're going to bring Dr. Dale Bredesen on our show live to share more of his findings. We want you to know in advance you'll be able to see that interview on tomorrow's 700 Club. So don't miss that. Right now, time for your questions right. and some honest answers. Honest you ready? Answer. Let's go for it. This is Lance Pat, who says, Pat, the pastor at a church we've been attending for a few months recently preached that married couples had to have children if medically possible and that you are living outside the will of God if you didn't choose to. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says that he wishes that all men would remain single as himself, but that it is better to marry than to burn. We've always believed that the decision to marry or not, or have children or not, was up to the individual and not mandated by the church. We're interested in your thoughts. Well, the early mandate between God and man was be fruitful and multiply and, and possess the earth and, and uh, you know have dominion over the earth. So part of it is to multiply. I mean, be fruitful and multiply. That's kind of like a heavenly mandate for mankind. But I tell you, we have multiplied like crazy. I mean, there's seven or eight billion people, and there are almost too many of them. So uh, to say that a married couple in the church has got to have kids, I mean, no way. I mean, this isn't some dictatorship or some theocracy. We have freedom. And freedom, you're exactly right, freedom is to decide to have children or not to have children. And to say that you must do it because you're sinning against God, I mean, that's ridiculous. All right. Okay. This is Serena who says, is it bad to ask believers or non-believers advice on something or should you only go to God? I've been going to God about something I'm going through. I've talked to a pastor and my grandma who's a very godly person. I feel as if I'm being impatient and putting other people's opinions over God's if I ask someone's advice after I've already asked God. 
I'm waiting for God to speak to me more about my situation, but should I ask other people as well about it? I tell you, if you have a line with the Lord and He speaks to you clearly, I mean, that's it. You don't need to have somebody else talk to you. But the Bible says, you know, when you make your war, seek counsel. Uh, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And so the idea of having godly counsel uh, is certainly biblical. And, uh, you know, when you're getting ready to make a major decision, it doesn't hurt. But I tell you what, if you know in your heart what God wants, then you'd better just do what God tells you mm -hmm. and not expose that to the unbelief of others. But uh, th th that, that's a, a rocky deal. But th the overall thing is godly counselors, they're people who have wisdom in certain areas, and it doesn't hurt to ask somebody. What do you think the market's going to do? What stocks would you recommend? Do you think I ought to invest in so-and-so? And somebody who knows better says, hey, look, that's a dog. You want to stay away from it. It helps to have people's advice, mm -hmm. all right? Okay, this is a viewer who says, I know that Jesus took all of my guilt and shame, and I understand that my sin was the reason that he died for me. What I want to know is, why do sexual sins make you feel more guilty? <clears throat> guilty than some other sins. Will God penalize me for the sexual sins that I commit in thought and action? I have a hope to be totally free of this. Look, you're a human being. If you're a man or a woman and you're, we're sexual beings, God <coughs> created us to reproduce. We have, you know, functional members that are used for reproduction. And he gave us certain desires and passions and uh, those desires and passions, unfortunately, when they're out of control, can lead to real serious problems. Broken families, children out of wedlock, all kinds of problems. So because sex is so powerful, the results of misuse of sex can, can you know, hurt more than, than if you, you know, eat too much chocolate cake at lunch. You know? Exactly. All right. <laughs> Just just a little more. A little more. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, this is Cynthia who says, My mom has been a Christian many years, but she refuses to forgive people and as a result has become cynical towards everyone, even family. Does God allow people into heaven who believe in Jesus but who do not forgive their brothers? Um, I tell you what is very clear. Uh, you know that prayer, uh, the Lord's Prayer? Mm -hmm and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's all, it's in the prayer. Jesus says, when you stand praying, if you have ought against any. Now, I, I'm not going to talk about the eternal destiny of somebody, but I will talk about this. I promise you, if you do not have a forgiving spirit, you will not even taste of a miracle. You will not have miracles of healing. You will not have miracles of financial provision. You will not have miracles of interpersonal blessing. You will cut yourself off from all of the blessings that God has for you if you have, if you lack forgiveness in your heart. Now, does that take away your salvation? I, I'm not prepared to say because I don't have clear scriptural mandate, but it's certainly, it is very, very clear in the Bible. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And you know, I, I've gotten to the point in my own life, I, I am incapable of holding a grudge against anybody. I can't do it because, you know, the Lord just wants me to forgive people. And I want to be blessed. I want to walk in His blessing. And so is it worth holding a grudge to cut off the blessing of God? Well, of course not. But that's the rule. And so uh, mm -hmm. you can take it for what it's worth. All right. Wise counsel. Okay. Thank you. Thank That's you. all the time we have for your questions today, but we thank you for submitting them. Well, coming up, a back to school lesson from best selling author Kevin Lehman. Learn how parents and students can get the most out of the school year when we return. Well, if you heard a collective sigh of relief over the last few days, it's probably from parents 
who finally shipped their kids back to school. But as Kevin Lehman says, the important thing for parents isn't what they get their children, that they get their children on the right bus. It's making sure that those kids are getting in the right seat. Take a look. Best-selling author Dr. Kevin Lehman says finding the right school for your child, whether public, private, or homeschool, is one of the most important decisions parents make. Dr. Lehman believes everyone deserves a quality education, but it's vital to be sure your child is matched to the right school. In his book, Education a la Carte, Dr. Lehman provides much needed tools to choose the best schooling option for the child and help students prepare for life, both inside and outside the classroom. Well, our good friend, Dr. Kevin Lehman is here with us now. We welcome you back to the Thank 700 you. Club. I want to mention at the top that all of the things that we're talking about today are included in your new book, Education a la Carte, Choosing the best schooling options for your child. Boy, every parent needs to know that, don't they? Yeah, I title my own books, and I think Education a la Carte is a pretty good title <laughs> because I don't think most parents are even aware of all the choices there are yeah. for kids today. Yeah. And it's not only getting your kid on the right bus, it's getting your kid on the right seat on the bus. Exactly. And there's magnet schools and charter schools, private schools, parochial schools, you name it, they're yes. out there. Yes. You know, I, I think one of the things that's difficult for a parent is to figure out what, what's your child's learning style? You know, most, most of us just went to school and wherever you landed, you landed. I mean, it was true for you. I was so surprised to read with all your accomplishments and your books and your studies that you were smart, but you had terrible grades in grade school. What happened? Yeah, I never figured I was smart till later on, but uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of my elementary, elementary education standing in the corner yeah. looking at paint chips. I mean, that was what they did with me. But <laughs> I, I graduated fourth and bottom of my class of high school but what then what motivated you what finally you didn't go on to college right away you worked for a while and it, what was it that made you say you know what I need to turn this around well I, I became a believer I met my wife in the men's room of a hospital when I was a janitor you want to talk about that yeah <laughs> well no it's she was the inspiration that God used in my life to help pull the trigger and and uh, after I became a believer God gave me motivation and I went in and never looked back I had 13 years of college but I mean, I remember being in a reading group with a girl who ate paste. I mean, uh, I was going nowhere. Okay. I think I had someone and in so my now, school who ate that stuff. But, but now, with with the book Education a la Carte, I challenge parents yeah. to take a look at the learning style yeah. of your kid. How do you know what it is? Kim? Well, you know, nobody's better equipped to know who your kid is than you are. You're the mm -hmm. best teacher your child will ever have. But is your kid uh, interested in people? data or things. There's three areas right there. You can see the future engineer who's working with his Legos. Mm -hmm. But again, you got a kid who's in music, loves music and drama. Would you send them to the public school down the street that just slashed their entire budget wow. and yeah. don't have much to offer? So again, I challenge parents, if, if there ever was a book that's a guide, a handy guide that, as my publisher says, this book has legs. It's going to be on the shelf a long time because there's so many opportunities out there for kids. And my friend Bill Bennett, who endorsed my book, by the way, what a, I've never asked anybody Does to endorse a book. Than that? <laughs> but he was so great to do that. But he says, you know, every elementary school needs to ensure that kids learn to read. Yeah. Well, I got news for you. That's late breaking news in a lot of places because they're not learning to read. And we don't set the high jump bar of life high enough mm -hmm. for kids. In Lehman Academy, we've started yeah, these schools. Talk about that because you've started some charter schools that are doing some pretty amazing work. Well, they are. They really are. Uh, we have high expectations for kids, okay? Very good. And we, have, we insist that parents become involved in the education. And uh, making children mind without losing yours and have a new kid by Friday, two of my parenting books, which was fun for me is to take those principles I wrote about your child is not the center of the universe, yeah. okay? And, and vitamin E, encouragement. How do you encourage kids today? Mm -hmm. And what about vitamin N, which is no? And we put that in the classroom. Plus, Terry, we put authority in the classroom teacher's hand. Which we have seen being eroded from the public classroom for decades From now. the get-go. So yeah. when you put that in a school, and I challenge parents to take a look around and see there's magnet schools that specialize in mm -hmm. certain types of training, and there's high schools where kids learn auto mechanics and welding. 
take a look at the myriad opportunities for your kids. Yeah. You can be a good coach to your child because every parent worries about peer group and about social pressure and competing in a global economy. The days of crayons and coloring in kindergarten are over. Those kids are reading. Yeah. It's accelerated. It, it is accelerated. And so is the work that comes home. I think parents are sometimes overwhelmed by all of that, Kevin. And now you're talking about potentially, if they're not in a charter school, placing kids in different schools. One family may have children in different schools. How do you juggle that? Yeah, and parents hear that. I think they want to get a gun out, let me have it. <laughs> but, you know, the truth of the matter is that your kids are different. Your firstborn, your secondborn child, any it's family true. are very, very different. But you know, it's, uh, it gets back to looking at kids' potential, what, they're, what they mm -hmm. do well, and trying to guide them through it. As far as homework goes, hey yeah. parents, don't do the homework for their kids. Yeah. Hey, would you turn that music down? I'm trying to finish your homework. <laughs> you know, that's the permissive parent today. They wanna do everything for their kid. For their child, so, yeah. So a principle, B doesn't uh, start until A is completed. Mm -hmm. But can I ask you, how do you get a child to want to do their homework after they've been in school all day and they've been focused and directed and everything's, you know, they come home, but we're raising our granddaughter and when she comes home, she's only in K-5, but she wants to play. Oh, yes. And I think it's good for kids to come home and play, then have a set time. And, you know, you can lead that horse to water, okay? You know that one, but you can't make them drink it. Yes. But again, I go back to a simple principle, like B doesn't happen till A. Kids yeah. always want any, everything. Mm -hmm. They're on the take. Yeah. Uh, they're hedonistic <laughs> little suckers. We know that from the day they're born. And so they're always asking for something. And a mm -hmm. simple retort, like, honey, I see your homework's not done. When that's done, we'll talk about B, mm -hmm. the next thing. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to, emphasize the authority and keep in mind yeah. that God's not authoritarian, yes. but he is a supreme what? Authority. Yes. You need to be authority in the home. We need authority in classrooms. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. If a kid gets in trouble at our school, I always tell the parents, hey, expect a call from school. But guess who's going to be on the phone? It's little Buford saying, <laughs> I don't know how to behave like a fourth grader. You need to come pick me up now. I and like that's that. keeping the tennis ball life, Terry, yeah. in the court it should be in. Mm -hmm. Child-bearing responsibility for their own actions and choices. Hold those little suckers yeah. accountable. It's great mm -hmm. training in life. <laughs> want to mention, the book is Education a la carte, and it's available wherever books are sold. Want to find out more about all the school options that are available to you. It's in here, and you're doing some great work with charter schools. Thank you. You're Always welcome. Spring Wise Council. <laughs> Good to have you with us. Well, still ahead, a family falls on hard times after dad gets laid off after 17 years. After I lost my job, it was really challenging. We had no money coming in and we had to start living on the credit cards. See how this family of six gets back on their feet after this. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Hurricane Irma could be on a collision course with the U.S. Irma grew into a powerful Category 5 storm today. The storm is heading straight to the Caribbean and could hit South Florida by Saturday. People there are already getting a head start by stocking up on water, batteries, lanterns, and more. Harvey, everyone's, you know, kind of taken back to see how bad that was and obviously we're from Florida we're used to this type of situation but it's always good to be prepared. Yes it is. A state of emergency has been declared in Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands and Florida. President Trump is expected to announce today that he's phasing out the Dreamers program over the next six months. The president tweeted this morning quote Congress get ready to do your job DACA. DACA is the name of the program started by President Obama. It lets illegal immigrants who came to the U.S. as children stay here and work and go to school here. Congress will now try to come up with a replacement plan for DACA. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com.
Jason Keene loves coming home to his wife and family, but he also loves going to work. Jason is thankful that he has a job because not long ago he was unemployed and burning through his life savings. The Keene household is always full of energy, especially when dad gets home. It's a very joyous event when I come home. They've missed me all day and it's evident when I walk in and it's just a blessing to come through the door and be greeted by a happy family. The times weren't always easy for this family of six. After 17 years with the same company, Jason was let go due to downsizing. After I lost my job, it was really challenging. We were facing a long time without any real reliable source of income. It was really hard after he'd been unemployed for more than three months and we had no money and we had no money coming in and we had to start living on the credit cards. While Jason sent out resume after resume, he and his wife Ashley used all of their resources keeping the family afloat. They quickly went through their life savings. If I didn't get a job soon, we were gonna have to make some hard decisions. We had such a tiny, finite amount of real money in the bank account. So in trying to hold on to that for real bills, because you know, they will turn off your electricity and they will turn off your water. And if you don't pay them for long enough, they will come and take your house from you. Knowing that the Keens were desperate, a friend told them about Operation Blessing Partner, One Heart Ministries. It was amazing the first time that we went to One Heart Ministries, Operation Blessing, thought it was just gonna be food, and then that they had toilet paper and diapers. Jason's job search efforts paid off when he found a job at a high-end appliance store. In about six months, I went from uh, unemployed to general manager. And we're still helping the family as they work to get back on their feet. It's very exciting to have an income again. It's meeting our needs right now. And with One Heart Ministries and Operation Blessing, we are meeting bills. If I could talk directly to the people who donate and support One Heart Ministries and Operation Blessing, I would tell them thank you. I appreciate what you're doing for us. If you're a 700 Club member, then it's you that they're thanking because you make it possible for us to be there for families like the Keens. You know, there are lots of people who are not in the position to be able to sustain and maintain their necessary living expenses if they were to lose their, their jobs, lose their income. Be a part of helping us to be there for people, not just in disaster emergencies like what's going on down in Texas right now, but just day-to-day -day life as it hits many, many people across our country. That's just a part of what 700 Club members do. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member, and you'll be joining with thousands of us who are out to make a difference in the lives of people here at home and around the world. So will you call now and join with us? Our number's toll free, it's 1-800-700-7000. It would be wonderful when you call and say, I wanna join the 700 Club, if you would say, I'd like to do it using Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. It means your bank does all the work. It's pretty wonderful. You don't have to have stamps or envelopes on hand or remember to send anything. It's all done for you. You can stop it whenever you want but it allows us to save some administrative costs that will put even more of your gift right into the lives of families like the Keens. So when you call, just say, I want to join the 700 Club and I'd like to do it using Pledge Express. Our way of saying thank you for using Pledge Express is to send you Power for Life teachings. You'll get one of these every month. It's teaching that we receive as a ministry here, as a body of Christ here, and we'd like to share them with you. So call now. Well, coming up, the seven-time All-Star with the Bronx Bombers gives us a glimpse inside the Yankees clubhouse. Still learning, as am I, but I think God has moved me in the right way in a lot of ways with, with how to deal with that. Matt Holliday takes us inside his church after this. Yankee Stadium has been called baseball's cathedral. For veteran slugger Matt Holliday, it's also sort of his church. Matt not only serves as the team's designated hitter, but that of a spiritual leader as well. Tom Buring has a story. Matt Holliday is baseball's esteemed clubhouse leader. The World Series champion, seven-time All-Star, and one-time batting champ has made a career of pushing his teams toward success. 14 years. Has that flown? Yeah, like I, I think some days it feels like it has flown and some days it feels like it's been a long time, but I try to just day to day it and, and try to keep it as simple as possible. And I look at pictures of when I started and, and you start thinking about how long it has been and some of the first teams that I was on that hardly any of them are still playing. It's been a cool progression. The progression continues with his fourth team, 
now as a New York Yankee. Playing in Yankee Stadium, wearing a Yankee uniform, does it make baseball look different for you? No, not really. Um, you know, I feel like that having a chance to play for another storied franchise in the St. Louis Cardinals, that's sort of the Yankees of the National League, if you will. And I played in the stadium. I played against the Yankees. You know, my grandfather was was, uh, was a huge Yankees fan. So there was, there was some ties that made putting this uniform on really cool. But when it comes to trying to play the best of my ability, I'm pretty used to that. But is there some cool vibe of playing in Yankee Stadium? Sure. With a clubhouse, full of this youth, exceeding expectations. You're running with this momentum. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, the season so far. The guys have been great. Coming from a place that I'd been for, for eight years to a new place was a little challenge for me personally, and I've really enjoyed it. And, and, and really, the guys have embraced me. And uh, I've been able to have a cool place on the team spiritually and, and uh, with our Bible studies and um, our chapels. For a lot of these younger players, what's the most common thing you hear that is something they need you know, I think the struggle of not doing well or just the day-to-day -day failure that comes with baseball is, is hard. Guys look for avenues, different places to get a relief from that. It's a hard game, especially in the, in the bright lights of New York City and dealing with the pressure that comes along performance and not having Jesus as the center of that, it can be rough and trying to find and turn to different things. How do you manage the pressure of performance? Do I deal with 0 for 4s perfectly? No. Having a relationship with Jesus and recognizing that my performance is not representative of how much he loves me and, and just being able to go out here and trust in the fact that I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be, doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and go, being able to separate this and go home and be a good husband and, and try to be a good father and help them understand what God's love looks like. Uh, that's a huge, tremendous responsibility for me that I take very serious. So I think God has moved me in the right way in a lot of ways with, with how to deal with that. What makes being a leader in a clubhouse any different when leadership is required to build up trust and relationship? It starts with being yourself. You earn that title by how you treat people, um, how you go about your business, how you work. You know, obviously experience helps, you know, get to know guys and really care about them. You relishing the mentoring? I do, I love it. There's guys here that, that are uh, new spiritually and still learning, as am I, but you know, just being able to contribute to, to things that I've learned and about interpreting scripture and, and being able to talk to them about what God is saying in, in certain passages, that has been really helpful for me, like, to getting in the Word every day and starting my day with, with chewing on scripture and, and having that center in my life. You know, I think in Timothy, when he talks about leadership and, and being in church, church leadership is, is everywhere. So um, this is sort of my church and it's for everybody's church and living our lives and leading people and loving people like you said, I'm, I'm an older player here, and, and leadership is part of, of uh, I think, the value that I bring. Matt, I didn't call you old. No. Now I'm when I'm looking at these, no, I didn't call you no, old. No, no. I, uh, I don't feel old. <laughs> uh, the age, in baseball years, maybe I'm old, but uh, I feel pretty good. Yeah, that's the prayer, man. Just make sure that I'm open to be used. However, if he wants to use me, that I'm available. Great opportunity to hear from the heart of a man who's making a difference. Well, thank you for joining us on the 700 Club. We want to leave you today with the song from the group FFH performing As For Me.